it's a good mnemonic device. Yes, we are recording this uh, lecture. So if you would like to watch this again, or if you know people who are missing it, please uh, get in touch with me or um, our office. We're happy to share the link as soon as we upload it. Um, so we have some ERIT um, announcements, but I think maybe I'll just stop. We'll have some lectures coming up. But if you're interested in finding out more about um, our uh, uh, lectures, uh, events, uh, feel free to drop us a line again and we'll add you on our list. Um, and as uh, Barbara pointed out, um, we will ask you to turn off your uh, audio and video uh, so that uh, we're not eating up bandwidth and, and there are no problems with uh, Barbara's talk. So uh, please just turn yourselves off. But uh, at the end of the lecture, during the question and answer, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to turn yourselves on um, and you can ask your questions. And during the lecture, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat area. Uh, I'll either um, read them out for Barbara or I will ask you to uh, read them out yourselves. So it'll be a more uh, personal uh, sort of a chat time rather than formal. So it is actually my uh, great honor um, and privilege to introduce Barbara Porter, who's here from Washington, DC. I know everybody's from some corner of the world and this is very exciting. One positive thing that we gained from this crazy period of time. Um, and she has a, a BA from Bryn Mawr College where I actually got my master's and PhD. So we did not overlap, unfortunately, but um, we do have that in, uh, in common. Also, I just uh, looked at her uh, CV and realized that her uh, uh, paper for her BA paper was on uh, the Near Eastern, um, no, the palatial archeology span in Northern Syria, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, which is a topic of great interest for me. So I'm very excited. Um, I know it's way behind you, but still seeing that topic makes me very interested. It's a topic that I've been working on for a long time. She has an MA, MPhil, and a PhD from the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University, where she worked on uh, North Syrian cylinder seals for her PhD. Um, she has uh, numerous um, positions. She's held numerous positions at Columbia University, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, New York University. And, and she was also, as I see, um, a research assistant for the great Edith Parada. So um, it's interesting for me to find out all these little details, but um, it's great. Um, she's been the director of ACOR, the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman, Jordan, from 2006 to 2020. And recently they changed their name, right? Is it this year or yep. just yep. last year? Yep. They became the American Center of Research. And um, uh, she will tell us a little more about uh, her experiences there, her work there, and everything in a few minutes. She has a huge um, line of awards and publications. I will not list them here, uh, but she's also been a part of many um, excavations and projects in England, in Austria, at, uh, in Italy, at Merlo um, Poggio uh, Civitate, um, Tal Mazar in Jordan, Tal Leilan in Syria, um, and she's led many uh, archeological and educational tours in many countries in Jordan, Turkey, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria, Iran. She's been um, all over the place. And, um, and we're very happy that she is with us tonight all the way from DC. Uh, and she will be talking to us um, about uh, the role of American of the American Central of Research ACOR in preserving Jordan's heritage. And again, I will ask you to please mute yourselves, your video and your audio. 
Um, and after her talk, we will have our opportunity to turn ourselves on and uh, ask questions and talk to Barbara. Thank you very much for coming tonight, Barbara. So I'm also turning myself off. Okay. Thank you very much, Elif, for that nice introduction. And what I would like to say is good evening to those in Turkey and in Jordan, and also for those in Europe and the UK, and good morning to those in the USA, including those in California or on the West Coast. I'm very impressed you're up for this. Uh, so you've already seen the flyer, so I won't elaborate on it very much, but I'll make some um, references to it later when I'm talking about certain images in the talk I'm gonna give for about 50 minutes tonight. And then there'll be questions, and I look forward to seeing everybody at that time. Of course, those in Jordan, I don't need to show this map, but I have to be respectful for the fact that I'm speaking for the friends of Ankara's Arit Society. And I want to point out that, of course, Amman is the capital, and ACOR has worked in many different places all over the country in its history since 1968. And in more recent years, has been down in Petra. And the last time I talked to LF, she was very excited about you know, thinking about one day going to Petra. There will be some elements of Petra in this talk, but ACOR's done much more than that. I'm trying to give the scope over the years about the people and places that have been so involved. Um, in terms of understanding the overseas research centers, you really do have to begin with thinking that but we all had different foundation stories, but as of 1981, KORC, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers has been a uh, network for all of us. Um, in the beginning, it was only like 10 different entities and both ARIT and ACOR were part of the original group. And then um, it expanded, particularly after 1986, when Mary Ellen Lane became the executive director. So this shows the list of all of the current members. And I, I really suggest going to the KORC website if you want to learn more about these entities. You can easily then go down to the places where we work, wherever they could be. And it's a very great tool. And I want to thank Katie Yost, the program director of, of KORC, for providing the slide, the banner slide of all the site of places. Now, why do I know all these people? Well, luckily, KORC organizes directors' meetings every three years or so. So when I moved to Jordan in June 2006, I already knew that the first place, besides Petra, of course, and taking, at that point, I was even already taking congressmen around Petra, but I got to go to Cambodia. I have to admit, I never thought in my life I would get to Cambodia, not to mention it virtually being paid for. But what I want to say about these meetings is that they're really important because of course the 23 or 25 different centers depending on the count or whatever um, were scattered the world over from Mexico to Mongolia and so having the chance to talk to people who understand the same issues that you're dealing with is really crucial and these are intense meetings where we talk and talk and then luckily if we can afford the time or the money on our own dime we get to do post loop so here in this top image you see Mary Ellen Lane and then beside her, Heidi um, Bideker, who's the deputy director. And I can't praise the role of KORC enough for all of our being able to function in the places that we do. Now, of course, Elif already mentioned Bryn Mawr, and there's a very strong Bryn Mawr connection. I went there undergraduate. I studied with Mahtal Melink, who of course is well known in the circles of archeology span in Turkey. One of my fellow students was Brian Rose, now the president of ARIT, who of course, I went to both Bryn Mawr and uh, Columbia with, I should be for fair, fair to say, he's a little bit younger than I am, if you want me to say that. And I want to point out that Nancy and I got to know each other really quite early on when she was doing her dissertation and coming up to talk to Edith Parada. And I have to laugh because yesterday when I was thinking about interconnections, I realized, now what year did she finish her PhD? And all I had to do is go two feet to my cylinder seal section, pull off her dissertation and say it was 1984. So it reminded me of our meetings in Edith Parada's um, actually home, she used to greet people there. And I also put in Betty Vermeer because she was a very influential person for Bryn Mawr in terms of admissions. She got a lot of students from the Middle East to apply to Bryn Mawr and making it quite a wonderful international place. So after um, Cambodia, we then went on to Senegal, another place I never thought I would go. And so here at that point, Elif had joined Arit in 2008. So here you see these three major key players in running ARET all together, and they would use their time 
at these meetings very fruitfully. And so most of the time I was by myself, although later, luckily, other associate directors got to join and that was actually a great bonus as well. Um, again, a place I never thought I'd get to, Mongolia. So again, you see the ARET team um, working together in the middle of the, the actual discussion points. And then you see Mary Ellen Lane with Chris Tuttle, who at that point was ACOR Associate Director, and then would follow her as KORC Executive Director for a few years. And on the very right, you see Rick Spies, who's in our audience, who's again with Mary Ellen, and he is now the uh, uh, Executive Director. But for more than 30 years, he was General Counsel, came to all of these meetings, so knew all of these centers very, very well. Not just because he visited them, but because he got to talk with all of these people involved in this work for overseas research. Um, just because I couldn't resist sending a few, I have to admit, it was fun putting together this talk, but probably the most fun was going to find all my slides from the or images, they were not digital, from the KORC trips and reliving when you can't travel, going to all these great places. And the landscape of Mongolia was truly spectacular. So in the lower left, you see me, my favorite shot from all the postlude, but you see um, Nancy by the yurt, you see Elif at an archeological site. And then we often at the end would do shopping and she and I had our best shopping moment in Indonesia. Um, but the one that was organized by Arit was in April, 2014. And I really do have to thank Nancy Lan one for these images because I, most people who know me know I take a lot of pictures. Unfortunately, this whole file was wiped out by the WannaCry virus. So if anything you learn from this is save your files in multiple places, because I'm really sad not to have those wonderful images, but luckily she could pull them out and pass them on to me. Um, because it's not about my travels. I'm not gonna show you images of Indonesia or of Tunisia, but again, to say the importance of these meetings and these discussions cannot be um, overstated. If you're interested in the role of these overseas research centers, there was a special journal article that was edited by Maura Kersel and Christina Look just on them. And at that point, Glenn Corbett, who was the former associate director, but then was KRC program director, wrote a very interesting article about ACOR called the broader scholarly and educational mission of ACOR. I'm gonna concentrate more on the archeological side, but again, I can't stress enough that if you're interested in sort of the history and the role Sort of the soft diplomacy of these places and the social networking that they allow, this is a really great start. In terms of starts, I'd be remiss not to say, of course, ACOR has its role and affiliation with KORC and has since 1981, but it's actually been affiliated with the American Schools of Oriental Research. And after the 67 war, it became ACOR. And this is just to show its initial stages um, at this wonderful school in Jerusalem built in the 20s, and they're about to have their centennial, and I wish them luck for organizing that. I'm a great believer in honoring people. So even though I'm not gonna dwell on the slide very much, I want people to realize that it didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, basically Azor, it was particularly G. Ernest Wright, who recognized the need for a center in Amman, and there was an initial committee. Among those in the committee, the one I knew the best was Jim Pritchard, who was more or less a mentor. But I also show Roger Boras at Tel Hesbon because Hesbon was this excavation southwest of Amman that literally was having its beginnings at the same time as ACOR. And it was a very important interaction between the two, um, so the excavations themselves and ACOR serving as a base. Um, I'll shortly be mentioning Hank Thompson and the fact that in these early days, it was annual professors like the model in Jerusalem is actually really quite important. And many of these people were doing either sort of rescue excavations for the Department of Antiquities, as I'll reference to, or they were actually teaching at the University of Jordan, or like Jim Sauer, reading everybody's pottery. And George Mendenhall ended up later, after he retired from Michigan, going up and teaching at Yarmouk University and really having a huge impact on the scholarship of Jordan. Of course, every overseas research center has some structure that includes a board, and there have been board presidents since 1970. Um, and there's now a current board structure of different presidents, first vice president from Jordan, second vice president in the States. And often when I say the States, I should point out that actually North Canada is very much included in a lot of a course structure and have been very important Canadian archeologists who worked 
in Jordan who were affiliated in some way or another with this work. Um, you can never uh, not recognize the efforts of the secretary and treasurer, and they have over the years played major roles. Um, this fun photograph in 2016 of the board, um, when we're together, we work hard, but we also have fun. And we're now on the patio of ACOR. And it reminds me when Matt Adams gave a talk last, about two weeks ago, as sponsored by Azor, he referred to the, the garden of the Albright in Jerusalem as a sort of the center of their sort of mixing and having a chance to spend time. This is a formal photograph, but I can assure you those chairs are well used way into the night as a place for people to relax and have a glass of wine and, or if they don't drink, there's lots of tea. Um, directors play their role in terms of how they guide. They work with the Board of Trustees, but they all work with a, a varied staff. The staff in the beginning was exceedingly small. Uh, the new director is Pierce Paul Kreisman, and I think he can say that he has a staff of all different projects of at least about 35. They're also looking for new people, so if you're interested in moving to Jordan, look on their website to see what jobs are open as well. But just like an excavation where you cannot, um, what's the word, you cannot um, minimize the food that's being offered, Acor from its outset had Muhammad Adoui, known as Abu Ahmed, um, as its chef. And he actually literally worked for Acor for 50 years. He goes back to 1960 to Jerusalem. So he worked for American institutions for 60 years, essentially. Um, and then what we're really lucky about his, in terms of his legacy, his um, two sons, Saeed and Abid, are key pins, or linchpins to how ACOR operates. And now his nephew is the head chef. Uh, Abu Ahmed, and by the way, ah Ahmed is a twin. He's got a brother named Mahmoud. As I'm a twin, I've always felt it was a little unfair that the one who is five minutes older gets it. I would be, you know, it would be Um Barbara or whatever, but I don't think it's quite fair. But anyway, that's just a little footnote in history. But he was honored with this Azor Award of the Albright Service Award in 2015. Since then, other board members have gotten it. And then uh, the librarian, Humi Ayubi, got it. And most recently, Nasreen Abul Sheikh, the Chief Financial Officer and Deputy Director, got it last year. And we're very proud of her for receiving this award. So of course, it's about people, but it's about place. And one of the things I really stress is that ACO was so fortunate that in the 80s, the board and the uh, people, the staff, basically, if I may say so, pulled off building, getting the money, building a building. So I showed two images. I showed the original 1985 bare bones as it's being constructed um, under the uh, care of Dave McCreary, then uh, the uh, director. So I often say it's the house that Dave built. Um, but then you see in 2006, upper right, um, as the trees are growing. And then one of my parting shots last spring, the hillside in front of it. Immediately in front of ACOR is this archaeological site, which was excavated by uh, uh, Pierre Bicay, my predecessor in the, um, in the 90s, and was also surveyed and excavated partially that before by another project. And it's really important to realize that having it right there allows for some really important training programs that are all I will allude to. Um, one thing to say, if you look in the lower left, and actually I will try to use my so this building right here, doesn't look like much from a distance, but it's the engineering school of the University of Jordan. And the director's apartment is on the other side. So I faced this building for basically um, 14 years. And what is it? Well, in the middle of it is a site called Tel Zeran. And what was fun in terms of thinking about what to share for this particular time, there's a very famous Ammonite bottle, which has a royal inscription that talks about the king wanting to enjoy his gardens and his um, cisterns and you know, vineyards, um, which dates to the late seventh century and is very important in terms of you know, the names of the Ammonite kings. But actually it was found in a small tell as you were about to construct this building on the campus of the University of Jordan. And it was actually found completely out of context in actually um, Mamluk um, setting. So it, it was also, when it was found, they realized how important it was the first person to uh, draw it was Bert de Vries, who I'll be referring to in a bit, uh, who ended up later being an ACOR director, um, now, of course, a board member. But one thing to say is, if you look at my cursor, this is all that's left. So they've done a garden, so they've smartly kept this garden there to show that's what it was built on. 
Um, I waited 14 years to have a chance to see it. Fortunately, my friend, Mesun Nahar, at that point, her husband was the Dean of the Engineering School. So in February, waiting all this time, dreaming to go, she took me over there. Um, and I could say it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, you have this whole dream about something you waited to see so long. But on the other hand, I was so grateful to finally know what was there. Um, so again, just to give you a location, here's the engineering school, the whole campus of the University of Jordan. In the middle of these fields is a core. Over here is the German Institute. Up here is the British. Um, and it's actually wonderful to be sort of like a troika on this hillside across from the University of Jordan. Um, and that gives you a nice bird's eye view of Herbert Salame, which I should point out has actually recently in the new ACOR newsletter, which you can get online shortly, um, shows that they actually did a cleanup project that I think was really instigated by Jack Green, uh, working with the Department of Antiquities, because I will admit that since 2006, it actually hasn't gotten the attention it was due because we were working on so many other projects. I'm now gonna have a sip of green tea. So as Humi Ayubi, the librarian of all those years knows, I really do like to call the library the jewel in the crown. It has many functions. It's used by thousands of people. And here you just see two snapshots of the upper library. In that picture alone, I see scholars from Holland, Italy, uh, Jordan, and it, but it plays multiple roles. Now the lower part is an image of students from uh, German Jordanian University working on a project and then one of ACOR fellows working there at the same time. However, things don't just say static. Right now, ACOR is doing a major renovation project. I was part of the team that helped get the funding from USAID, but I will be grateful to Pierce Paul that he's undertaking the project and I can just sit here and enjoy my beautiful environment and not worry about moving 40,000 books and then doing the renovation of that spot. And just to show you how scary it can look, the image on the left shows you a January shot of pulling up for all the infrastructure so this is no small task, but by the time everything is finished, things will really be spectacular in terms of how ACOR runs. So the ACOR library under its rubric is actually the ACOR photo archive project. And here you see um, just a way to, to access it. Um, I'm, these are actually happen to be uh, photographs by Jane Taylor. Um, you know, I put on the, the flyer was an image by her. There are many, many of hers. Um, so you can see those results in the thing. So all I can say is encourage you, if you want to have, see more pictures of beautiful Jordan, go to this photo archive and you won't be unhappy because you can see as many as you like in one fell afternoon, let's put it that way. So the lower library gets transformed in the evening for lectures. And so here you see Jane Taylor who gave a charming talk uh, in May of 2014 with her spectacular photographs and her poetry. Um, and the lower left, uh, perhaps more academic version, where you end up seeing Gary Rollison, who's been affiliated with ACOR since he arrived in 1978, really talking about work he's been doing in more recent times in the um, Eastern Desert of Jordan. Again, what's important, after his talk, we started recording them and putting them on uh, ACOR's YouTube site. So should you be bored one afternoon, go hunt these particular lectures out. There's a whole wide variety, some about the art scene in Amman, others about long-term projects. And so I would definitely say, I always love uh, Jamie Fraser, who's given two lectures and both of them are well worth searching out. But in the beginning of one of his, he said, well, yes, when I used to do my editing, I'd put on an ACOR podcast. And sometimes he'd say, it was like a eureka moment in his research. So maybe that will happen to you. So just to get the thread in the 80s, so in the 70s, there was annual professors that did small rescue projects with the Department of Antiquities or the University of Jordan. But in the 80s, they started sort of like the bigger digs. And one example would be Ein Ghazal. And this is just on the outskirts of Amman on the way to Zarqa off the highway. It's been threatened many times. One thing I would say is that don't spend a lot of time trying to go visit. It's really kind of a sad sight. I mean, if, if somebody like Zaydan Kafafi or Gary takes you, definitely go, but don't go thinking you'll be able to figure it out unless you're really clever with maps and stratigraphy. It's still even tough. Um, you see a much younger Gary than the one you saw giving the lecture in 2015, inspecting one of the bolts. 
And thank goodness they, oops, sorry, well, there you get him again, sorry. Um, this site is, is massively important for understanding the Neolithic of Jordan. These incredible statues of, of plaster were discovered there in two caches. This happens to be one of the caches. And then more recently, Gary wrote a, a newsletter article for ACOR, which was a perspective of 40 years and the change in thinking of the Neolithic. So if in the audience, you're more interested in the Neolithic than later the Nabataean or the Byzantine, this would be a great source to understand what's happening in Jordan's um, academic world of the Neolithic. When you come, and this is often what I'll say, if you plan a tour, and it doesn't include at the Jordan Museum, that's a shame. And if you see a brochure that doesn't include it, I wouldn't take that trip because it's such a stellar place to understand the history and archeology span of Jordan. And I, this first room is all of these incredible statues, plaster statues of Ein Ghazal, that they, you know, from let's say around 6,500 BC. And they really are amazing. There are a few others that are up in the, on the Citadel Museum, which I'll be showing shortly, the museum itself a bit. Um, and so one thing I just learned from a presentation by Harriya Amar, who has been one of the major curators, um, technical advisors for this museum, the Petri Museum, she said it was actually Princess Sumaya bin Hassan who was the one who said, yes, we must start with the spectacular space. And it really is spectacular. There's also a great film showing some of the uh, footage of removing the statues and the care that it takes to move these fragile items. That's another story. Now, all the objects in that museum and any museum in Jordan are under the authority of the Department of Antiquities. ACOR itself is actually under the Department of Antiquities Authority. All of our sort of work permits and the like come through their administrative offices. The relationship with each director general is obviously something that should be fostered. And the headquarters now are near this particular Rojum um, or uh, Ammonite Tower. Rojum just means ruin. Uh, Malfoup is actually, I think, might be the same in Turkish. It's um, cauliflower or is it cabbage? It's cabbage, I think. In any case, that doesn't matter. Um, and I did manage to get in there once, which was fantastic. It's actually a closed site. But it was actually, again, when Roger Boris was affiliated with ACOR, he did that as a rescue project for the Department of Antiquities. So it's, again, part of these earlier legacies that are still with us. Now, to understand the role of the department, I'm not going to go on and on, but it's really important to understand that they actually started an annual as of 1951. And then in 1980, there was a conference on basically the history and archaeology of Jordan, which started in 1980 under the patronage of Prince um, Hassan bin Talal. And he's been the patron of all of them ever since. And <clears throat> one thing to say is if you're interested in very, you know, all these reports that are in these volumes, all you have to go to is the ACOR website go under library, go to its um, you know, the search mechanism, and you can download these all now. And so the department should be very proud that these are actually very hard to access in many of the libraries. So now um, that you can just do so by the click of a button is truly extraordinary. And just to prepare for this, I had fun searching out about four or five articles that are really important. Where I did a crash course on Jordan, because as Elif mentioned, my work prior to moving to Jordan in 2006 was primarily leading tours, so I learned a lot about many places, but I was actually working on cylinder seals of Syria. And so, and I had the chance to work at Tel Elan with Maria Maria Gates and many other wonderful people, but I actually, my first year, had to both raise the money and help with, be one of the main organizers with Doug Clark of this really important conference, the 10th conference, that Pierre Bacay had suggested in the early 2000s that he, um, ACOR or the America should actually host this finally in America. He had never been in America. And then he was smart enough to actually retire. So I learned early on, this was one of my main mandates for the first year. And it was a fantastic conference in Washington, DC, George Washington University, and that Ambassador Skip Ganem helped us tremendously securing spaces and making it, I mean, who can't not remember with great pleasure a event in the Museum of Natural History, uh, you know, having your gala dinner with the elephants, etc. So in any case, I want to say that it was a highlight, but it also was a way of meeting so many people who were involved. And where we were all very fortunate is Prince Hassan really cares about the archaeology of Jordan. He's the official patron of the British Institute, but he really is the unofficial or, or of course, 
official, uh, being who he is, of almost all archaeology, and he's played roles in health and preservation. He's actually come to ACOR to give talks to KORC um, seminar groups, and we're grateful for the support he gives to the heritage, as does his daughter, Princess Amaya. ACOR's role in preservation is also in the 90s was important because uh, JADIS, the Jordan Antiquities Data um, Information um, basically the whole system was actually initiated by a special CRM, Cultural Resource Management Initiative, that was again, like almost all projects supported by USAID. That migrated in the 2000s with a man named Steve Savage, who basically updated it with more uh, recent technology. And then what was very fortunate is that in 2007, the Getty Conservation Institute and the World Monuments Fund took on the project until 2014, and really made it a, a much more formal thing with called Mega Jordan. But I want to point out that JADIS, the database that was built on uh, first by um, Gaetano Palumbo and then by Steve Savage, that by the time it migrated into Mega had like 10,000 sites. Always, of course, it's held by the Department of Antiquities. And that's really important to, to realize. Um, the other thing to say is you see in the lower right, um, and there's somebody who's actually not on mute. And if they don't mind going on mute, I would really appreciate it. it. Reminds me of the times at the Metropolitan Museum when you're talking in a in a gallery and a school group comes in and you are challenged. <laughs> so here, that picture on the lower right is actually the view from the director's office upstairs. So when these training programs would happen, people often thought, "Well, I didn't actually spend much paying attention," but actually, I was often looking at them and they didn't even know it. So. To learn about the history, you can go on the website to see the 25 years. You can go look at the 40th anniversary issue. Um, there are many ways to learn about the history. We did a smaller booklet for the 50th anniversary, which again, easily accessible on, on the website. We chose to add the cover image, really one of the flagship projects of the 90s, the work that was done on the Amman Citadel. And another way that ACOR supports um, has since 1991, is gathering archaeological reports. And I remember in my days as a graduate student, um, Edith Parada <clears throat> worked on the ones for Iran, uh, Mahdal Melink did the newsletters of Turkey. And these were really important resources that with time, now with new technology, with everybody can access on the web, you don't need. But I would say that in the time that they were all created, they were really essential ways of collecting data on what was being done in country. Now ACOR has taken up the project of doing it electronically, and the submissions have been ongoing basically since 2016. And as I say, easily available on the website. So now just a survey of um, the sites. And I want to say that this is an old fashioned map that's not even all that accurate, but finding a map of Jordan isn't really so easy. So here we're going Umkais up in the north, ancient Gadara all the way down to Aqaba. And the reason I choose those places is that um, basically um, work it was done on a rest house up in the north. And then below is Islamic Isla, which was a University of Chicago project that in 2004, it, uh, Pierre Bacay worked on an archeological park with the Department of Antiquities and the Ministry of Tourism. So I love the Umkais rest house. Here you are in a site because at that point, people weren't uh, going that much to, there was a lovely restaurant, really makes for a really wonderful experience. I show some pictures from Bert Vries that are in the ACOR um, photo archives. And one thing to say is that I've gone there many, many times. And I really think that any tour that you take to Jordan should be friends of Aret go there, definitely should include them guys. Um, I was privileged to be with a group of people from the British Institute to go and look at a German Institute initiative, which was um, essentially teaching Syrian refugees and local Jordanians from the community of Umkais for stonemason technique, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done on site. And you're seeing uh, this, basically the master mason, Tobias Horn, basically being kind to show us what to do. Um, and if you look, here's the house that is right beside and over here's the distance where the house itself is. Here, my twin sister Joan is working with, she 
passed, uh, Carol Palmer of the British Institute is passing the baton. This is Ahmed Alomari that if you ever get to go, hopefully you have the privilege of having as a tour guide or if you're a hiker going on a hike. And nowadays you can also do meals with local families, which is another wonderful way of experience the area of this beautiful part of Jordan. For many, many years, I went there. I had no idea of the tunnels that were underneath, but fortunately at this time, we were privileged to go into the tunnels that are part of a massive underground system that came from Syria. There's about 150 kilometers that have been uh, tracked. German um, excavators and engineers have studied the system. There was an US ambassador's fund grant that in theory was supposed to make it more accessible, provide better lighting, it was already accessed in the 90s um, and Amar Hamash did some design. There were some staircases that could have led you up to the rest house, but then it basically went fallow for many, many years. And as I say, I didn't even know it was underground. I wish I had, but now in theory you can go, but you basically need to have access to the Department of Antiquities or this private entity. But just to show you, underneath the site alone, this is the path that you take, but it's a massive array of different um, tunnels. I think there's, you know, it loops and loops around, but they actually take you from one, exit one to exit two near the North Theater. So Umkais was an ACOR project in as much as we helped on the rest house. But what we did, and I've already referred to it, is the work that was done in the Amman Citadel in the 19, early 1990s. Basically in the Amman Citadel, here's the um, uh, Roman period temple, Here's the museum itself. Here's the amazing Islamic palatial complex, which was actually a um, essentially a, a Spanish ex, ex, well, restoration project. This is a uh, amazing cistern and there's a bath complex. For <clears throat> those of you who are interested in baths. Um, if you're gonna work and excavate, <clears throat> obviously you have to publish. So luckily according to major publications. And what was fantastic is in the nineties, ACOR Basically, was very fortunate to have Chrysanthus Conolopoulos come in as an architect and thereafter work on all of the projects that led at the same time also to Petra. And he created a, a model reconstruction because what was only restored, what was um, four new drums were added, but it honored the Venice Charter where you do, do more than 10% of what's on the ground. And a lot had been robbed out in antiquity for the Islamic period and likewise for uh, the Ayyubid Tower that was nearby. Um, Chrysanthus, you see here, also had created a crane, and I know, I can only imagine right now, these are, we're in a little archaeological museum on the ground floor of ACOR, so those are going to be moved while they do this rehabilitation project. I don't know their actual fate. Um, the Citadel is obviously a central place to any visit to Jordan. Um, basically, nowadays, there was a new uh, USAID project creating paths in 2010, and pretty good signage. Um, I will admit to being a little disappointed that they don't recognize their earlier projects and say that the Citadel was restored by ACOR in you know, 1991 to 1994, essentially, with the USAID funding. But part of what I'm doing today is to set the historical record straight uh, so people understand some of these contributions. I know when I gave a version of this talk, which is actually on the website of ACOR in uh, February 2018, the beginning of its 50th anniversary, there were about six people from USAID in the audience. At that point, many of them had to sit upstairs because we didn't have enough space. And evidently one kept saying, we did that, we did that, we did that. So there was a lot of support of major projects that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, since the late 1980, since 1988 and that Citadel work, which was the Department of Antiquities that segued into ACORS projects, the person who actually had the most continuity was Nayef Zaban. He ended up becoming ACORS basically conservation technician worked on the projects in Petra, but then from 2007 on, when most of ACOR's Petra projects had finished, it seemed really smart move and Chris Tuttle and I really thought this would be the way to go and luckily the board of trustees approved to have him help other projects because there's a dearth of actually good conservators in Jordan. And so here you can see him working on a variety of different types of pieces of ceramics and plaster he also did an amazing job with coins. For example, I really forget the numbers, but the coins from uh, the Dare Plateau in Petra on um, project under Cindy Finlinson, I think I can easily say he probably cleaned a thousand coins, but I better should check that for the next time I talk. 
And Cora also did a project in Madaba, the Madaba Archaeological Park, and produced a book in 1996, which talks a lot about the vernacular architecture, the Ottoman 1920s buildings that are there. It's a wonderful read. Um, for those of you who want to be oriented, here is the so-called um, complex that you have over the Church of the Virgin. And this area will become um, where you have the end of, you end up having, then this is Marble Park East. Then you'll have the West, which is now called um, a new project called MRAP, which is later I'll be talking about Shep, where they hope to conceive of a new museum. Uh, Maraba indeed is a city with wonderful mosaics. Of course, I know Turkey has spectacular mosaics, but there's still fascinating mosaics here. And this is to say another major contribution ACOR did was in 1993, create this book uh, written by Father Michael Picciarello of the Studium de Vitae Franciscanum. And it was co-edited by Patricia Bacay, the Associate Director, and Tom Daly, who was of USAID, but really helped on a lot of ACOR publications, as he actually did on the Maraba book I just showed. I actually can never resist showing the picture of Father Picciarello, uh, basically with the page proofs, because any people in the audience who've been writing books, or trying to get things organized, realize what a nightmare can be. Luckily, he had good people helping him. And this is the dining room table that was my dining room table for 14 years. Um, I tended to work in other spaces, but still, he obviously needed space to work on. So that's one of the major publications of ACOR. A minor one, which is still very important, is the 2001 7-1 on megalithic Jordan. And uh, Pierre and Patricia Bikai had said to the former Dutch ambassador, Geyer Scheltema, of course, willing to produce this gazetteer. Um, and then, of course, um, it became fell to me. But I'm very proud that we produced it because this is one of the vanishing parts of, a course, of Jordan's heritage, where these dolmens, which are from the Bronze Age, or early Bronze Age on, are amazing structures. They're also easily used for modern quarrying. And so many of them have been destroyed in recent times because people just love the stones for their houses in Amman. And this is where the Department of Antiquities is trying, but sometimes it's really hard to actually uh, protect the sites in the way that they would want to. And so the archaeologists who are involved in Jordan try to help out on this. The University of Jordan has lifted some of the dolmens up to a park in front of the museum there. There's some of them from Damia Field in front of the Jordan Museum. And these were actually really important acts because they actually keep these things for posterity. We're now moving down to projects in Petra. If you're interested in the Nabataean period, that's not really what I'm talking about. I did a, a lecture in November. And I'm happy to share that link with the friends of, with, with Arit. And so they can, anybody who's really interested in that, it's very specialized about traveling. And so my, my chances to travel in the region, including down all the way to Hegra in Saudi Arabia, Medina Saleh. But this is just a map that shows you the extent, actually, to be quite honest, it goes all the way up to Damascus, of the Nabataean kingdom. That if you want dates, more or less from second century BC, the second century AD is its heyday. In 106, Petra became under the authorities of the Romans. It's a spectacular place and many of the people in the audience, those obviously Jordan have been there, but people from Turkey, not all of you have. And again, one of the things I hope you get out of this is the idea that you'll put together a, um, a tour for Aret to Jordan. I know there probably were ones before, but it's probably time to do that again. Sadly, Jordan is a bit expensive. So it won't necessarily be cheap, but it'll be certainly be worth it. So most of you know the, the, the narrow gorge called the Seek. It comes to the treasury. Um, the area that Acor did most of its work is on this hillside. This is called the Wadi Musa. And the Petra Church was a major focus, but I'll mention some other uh, projects as well. That's the north side of the Wadi Musa, and the south side is the Great Temple, which is a Brown University project I'll talk about a bit. Um, I was very grateful to Jane Taylor for giving me this map, just because actually almost all maps of Petra are in books and has the seam right through it. So to have a book that a, a, a book map that's really excellent. Um, again, this is the northern hillside I'll be talking about mostly from ACOR projects. That's where they've been working on and off since 1991. Um, in 2008, the only time I'm actually I'll go back. But where I'm taking this picture from is you can climb up this way on a, on a path to above the so-called palace. You know, the royal tombs, 
you can actually then come around and actually have a great view of the treasury. But from this vantage point, you have an incredible view of the center city. So I took this in 2008, the only time I managed to climb up there. Um, I would, would love to have had another chance. Uh, this will be a course Temple Ruling and Lions project that I'll be delving into. Here you see the whole great temple project. And I will be mentioning that this is uh, Casa Obint excavated by the French, which is the only freestanding building from antiquity that's still freestanding in this way, another temple. And those of you interested in the Crusader period, this is the Crusader period of Al Habis, which basically just means in Arabic, the prison. So one of the things that happened during ACORS um, starting its projects in Petra, Brown University commenced work on the south side at the so-called Great Temple. And eventually it was um, reconstructed and it was the late Dr. Fawad Al-Khesha, the director general, who wanted a more massive project that allowed people to understand the volume of that kind of structure. It was not obviously uh, constructed in full because you can see on the right what it might have looked like. It had these spectacular elephant headed columns and uh, Martha Schakowsky, the excavator, has produced three volumes. And in my last book on the Nabataeans, I give all those references and you can easily find them by going to Google or Amazon. Um, Besides the Great Temple, it was work done by Leanne Bedell in, this, in what we call the Garden and Pool Complex. She often brings uh, student groups. Uh, of course, in the last few years, because of COVID and other problems, she hasn't been able to. But this is one thing I just want to impress you with the Nabataeans, their use of water, and the fact in the middle of Petra, you have basically something that's virtually a Olympic-sized swimming pool. Again, another subject that you know, Leanne could talk herself for two hours. Um, this is taken from a map that was created by ACOR, working with Hashemite University, Talal Akashe, and the architect, Chrysanthos Kanalopoulos, and actually was supported also by Japanese funding. Um, it's been something that was turned over to the Department of Antiquities and the authorities in Petra who do things. And someday one hopes the map will actually get published in full. We're now turning to the, the Petra church on that hillside. It was a project that was initiated basically in 1991 by Penn, Ken Russell. Sadly, he died in the month, the very month that the work started in May 1992. Um, but he was the one who said, yes, there is um, a church on that hillside. I've seen the tessera. I even saw them in the 70s, but he went back in 1990 and confirmed. And on the right, you can see the place with the shelter now after it was really opened in 1998, with the final project being central floor of the nave as restored by Patricia Bakai's efforts. So here you see Pat Patricia then continued to work up on the ridge at the Blue Chapel and the Ridge Church. And I love this picture of Pierre in one of the structures in Madaba that again was also part of ACORS USAID supported shelters over churches. One of the things to say about the project in Petra that was I still think is well worth commenting is that the way it was designed from the outset was to have conservators on place it was a long running project, maybe too long running. Robert Schick, who's one of the people who was involved in it is in the audience. Thank you, Robert, for attending. And they had the privilege of li living in Mazal's camp, a building now owned by the Department of Antiquities. But this was um, actually originally one of the great, hot the hotel, it was Mazal's camp, the Mazal family, and actually Mona Mazal is actually also on in the audience that had other major hotels like the Philadelphia Hotel in Amman, and when you read books like Agatha Christie visiting, you know, she writes about, you know, they would have people stay in caves, but this would be the central place and they would have these lavish dinners. Um, I never had the chance to experience it. I did go in when um, a team working on as on tour uh, was there, but I never actually actually ended up going there. But you can see Harriet Amr, whose work at the, I already referred to at the Jordan Museum and the Petra Museum was actually the ceramicist on the project, and Noel Seaver and Tom Roby were part of the uh, conservation team. And one of the main conservation efforts were the mosaics themselves. They knew there were mosaics there, but they didn't know quite how spectacular they would be. And on the lower right, you can see Fatma Mari, who's now a professor at the University of Jordan. She ended up doing her dissertation on the recycled glass from the church. On the lower left is Livia Alberti, a, still a major uh, conservator, Italian conservator who works all over the world. And by chance, I actually saw her in Paphos uh, in 2018, but I didn't know who she was, so I never even said hello, nor did I say hello to Tom Roby, who was with her at the time. This gives you sort of an aerial view. Obviously, the one on the left was taken 
by um, the Myers in the time before there was a shelter created in the, in the later 90s. Um, and it shows you, gives you a chance to see the whole thing. Once they excavated in the corner and they came down on 140 papyrus scrolls, they realized they had to do much more excavation. So they opened the atrium. This is the baptistry. Here's the baptistry. Here's where the recycled glass was found. And that's what you see when you now go today. If you want to understand it, you go, maybe you won't buy the book because it's not inexpensive, but uh, luckily I probably read it five times. It's one of my many Bibles. And so it's well worth for understanding the excavations and the stratigraphy and the finds that were found there. But you can see some of them in the Petra Museum, which we were talking about. Um, one of the things to say is that ACORS worked from its outset with the Friends of Archaeology, a group that was founded in the early 60s. And in the early days, the directors like uh, Bert DeVries and Dave McCurry and of course Jim Sauer would lead tours. And it was sort of like the only show in town. Well, now there are many more opportunities. Everybody would want me to lead a tour to Petra. So one Friday in March of 2012, I took the group down. Here you can see it was all in the Petra Church. It was only to talk about the Petra Church, to give people an understanding of what was there. It was great fun, but Friday was the only day I took off. So I decided that I loved doing that once, but it was not going to be my every Friday activity because I actually wanted to go explore some of the great sites with friends and colleagues, which I couldn't do if I was doing organized tours. Now, one thing to say, once you've excavated it and presented it, and the church opened in 1998, it was great fanfare. Um, uh, Queen was there. It was a really special moment. It's had many wonderful visitors, but there were other periods where you had to continue the restoration of these mosaics. Um, it's, so luckily, ACOR uh, created a endowment, which I'll be talking about in a minute, but we've been very grateful for the efforts of Franco Ciorelli, who's also worked in Madaba and worked at Mount Nebo, a project I'm not talking about at all, but it was an amazing project that, again, if you go, you should visit it. And Antonio Vacoluzzo, who's well known for his work in Italy, um, particularly at Ravenna, they came and they did this project and they relayed the floor to make it more stable. Um, this is almost like a footnote that I couldn't resist including, is because Pierre Bacay was um, excellent in so many ways. He was good about renting property, as he did in Madaba, even around Amman. Um, I'm not a landlord type, so I got out of that business. He also was great about raising money. So, okay, we found it, but now perhaps the funds are no longer there. So in one of his early tri um, trips of people who had means, he started having them virtually adopt a um, mosaic. And so in an issue of the newsletter uh, in 2015, basically Miriam Salih and I created this homage to those who um, adopted a mosaic. And I would say that Mary Ellen Lane was one of them. The last person to do so was my twin sister and her husband in my honor. And I'm showing you down in the lower right, the mosaic C26 in my honor. And those of you who know me, I love textiles. So how could I resist this guy with these great leggings? Okay, he doesn't have a head, but I have good imagination. I don't really know what he's offering, a platter or something. But so C26 is right up here. If I was better with Photoshop, I would have made that green. And said that was the last one. But perhaps uh, other spaces have not been adopted. And this endowment really is crucial for ACOR to keep on helping the Petra Archaeological Park and the Petra Development Region Tourism Authority continue maintaining this. There's some interest in changing the shelter cover, which is going to be quite a challenge. When it was built in the 90s, it was basically a quarter of a million dollars. I really don't know where the funds will happen to do that. Uh, so let's just maintain that shelter and keep it covering and protecting the space. Uh, in terms of objects, the reason I refer to this is you've seen it as the logo. It was actually found in the church in 180 fragments. Again, it was restored. It's actually made from marble from Turkey. So this idea of the second century um, Roman high culture vase making its way to Petra and the material that is foreign to Petra itself. And the fact that then it was an heirloom already probably 300 years old when it was used in Petra church gives so many different elements to the history of Acor. Excavation, preservation, thinking about an object's basically provenance history and context so I just put that as a footnote. And again, I, I also want to pay homage to the, the restorers who did it. One of the other major things about the Petra Church was this discovery up in this corner of these scrolls. This was found in December, 1993. 
And it was quite a shock. The Kais were in the States. They were right there, right after an Azor annual meeting. And so fortunately, Spig Fiema, who you see down here, basically they realized these things had to come out almost immediately and be brought up to ACOR. So here you see Kathy Valentour, who was actually conservator down on the Aqaba project, who came up to help. Because at this point, they, they were going down to put in the pillars for the shelter. They were not expecting to find 140 fragile sixth century papyrus scrolls. So when you find it, you create a system and the Kais consulted with many people, including Glenn Bowersock, and he was the one who suggested some of the people to work on it, including Jakub Frozen from the University of Helsinki. And so here you can see how you open a scroll. I'm not gonna talk about that, but you can see you have to do it pretty carefully. Um, one of my favorites is the shortest one. We're not quite sure the date, but let's say these are all in the sixth century from about 535 to 595. And this is a list of stolen goods. Um, if you want to read about it, we actually have it posted on the ACOR website. But evidently, a priest who rented an apartment from another priest is said to have stolen a table, a bird, logs, a key. And of course, then swears he didn't do it. I was very privileged to have a chance to write the um, signage that's in the Petra Church. And thanks to USAID, they were able to be installed in fall of 2013. So with a, a tour group I had devised, I actually got to see it for the first time with them. And it was really actually quite an exciting moment. And we'll talk a bit about signage, it's a big deal. Um, but I love the fact that Hamoudi, who's actually been part of the project from the outset, is actually reading the text, that's that same text I just showed you, the list of stolen goods. And actually he, he's correcting me because I think I put 150 there and because we're not really sure the exact number. Um, and he says, well, it's 140. So they care and they know. So if you want to learn more all about it, again, these are books you can buy. Um, you can buy them on the ACO website. You can buy them through Amazon. You can buy them through you know, Stevens's distribution group. Um, I am very proud of them because Patricia was in charge of publishing the first one, but the other volumes were all under my aegis. I wrote the preface for all of them, but more to the point, I got them printed at the press. So if you want to know about the process, I talk about it in the um, October lecture that was given um, in ACOR's 20th and 50th anniversary year, but we were so honored to have the two major um, editors, uh, Jakob Rosen and Antti Aryeva, come from Helsinki and speak. So if you're interested in sixth century context of who was living there, what it meant to be part of this elite church family, because it's all under the archive of a man named Theodoros. Um, and of course, he has ancestors who've referenced their Nabataean names. You can learn all about by going to the ACO website and watching this performance. And it was a performance. We had a great time. While work was being done over at, let's say, example, at the um, Great Temple on the south side, and also was being worked by um, Philip Hammond at the Temple of the Alliance, uh, Patricia Bakai was working up above the church at these two places called the Blue Chapel and the Ridge Church. Again, they were in con my context of my uh, previous lectures. Oops, sorry. But again, if you find it, do you decide to end there? Do you decide to restore what's there? So basically, Pierre. Um, Patricia, but particularly Patricia, with um, the architect uh, Chrysanthos and many other people, ended up making the decision of restoring the four columns that were part of this Byzantine church, but they in turn were of course recycled and reused from a Nabataean structure, as you can tell by the Nabataean capitals on the top, but the marble, oh sorry, the granite comes from Egypt. So it's again this idea of cycle and reuse. We know that below there is probably a military, um, uh, in this case, it might actually be a house, but it could also be a military installation because this is a very strategic part that looks over the middle of the central part of Petra. So again, different layers, but you can read all about it in the publication. Later, uh, work was done further along the North Ridge by Tom Parker and Megan Perry, now both uh, ACOR board members, and they found a surprise. They were digging down, trying to find the non-elite tombs. It came down um, two marble statues. Some of you realize that of course marble doesn't exist in Jordan. So these are imported Roman period statues that are of the goddess Aphrodite. Fortunately, they put together a program and they invited Mark Abbey, who's a specialist on polychromy. And then they actually had Michael Morris, a conservator, who was able to get a KOR grant and come and work in the fall of 2018 on these statues. 
Um, I'm particularly proud of the photograph on the lower left. I took it when there was a Japanese film crew, um, basically in fall of 2018, the same time that Michael was there. They were particularly interested in showing how the restoration project was going. Uh, so again, it's, it's been highlighted in the ACOR newsletter, but it also is something that's well worth uh, looking at, especially when you get to the Petra Museum, because here you can now see um, that what we call Aphrodite II, the slightly smaller one as it's preserved, but the more stable because Eros was still there and the whole base was there to support her, as restored by Michael, was put into the Petra Museum or the Rachmu, I feel I should correct that, Rachmu Petra Museum in spring of 2019. And it's the side, as you hope you recognize, Acor's uh, signature um, piece, the Cantharos, or the vase, the Panther vase from the Petra Church. On the left, you see so called Aphrodite One. And I gather from um, colleagues that she's now soon to be moved down to the Petra Museum and eventually will be installed there as a special exhibit. And that will be a really wonderful moment. Uh, again, this honors the excavators, the, um, the grantors, the conservators. Um, and the fact that the Petra Museum now exists as a place to house and showcase the extraordinary finds from Petra. The Temple of the Winged Lions was an ACOR project after the excavations of Philip Hammond. And I'm not going to elaborate much about it. There's a lot on the ACOR website. Here you can see it in an um, aerial, it's, it's a composite aerial shot that was done by University of San Diego project in November 2012. And then here you see a view as if I was looking from this very tent, which was the project tent that protected everybody, towards the temple itself to the west. Um, but there were multiple layers. There's the previous history under Philip Hammond, who died in um, 2008. And then in 2009, really its instigation of Chris Tuttle. Basically, ACOR took it up with the Department of Antiquities and, and uh, Lynn Hammond, his widow, allowed his archive to come to Jordan so that the project could continue and be, the site be preserved and understood. So here there are conservation and training efforts. All of this was to say is that there was really this component of community outreach that was central to, to the new work of the Temple of the Alliance. Um, there's more elements about it, there's landscape rehabilitation, because of course we all know that unfortunately archeological sites provide, produce dumps. So you've got to think about where they are, what the future of them is, is and that's all part of the strategy of, of the TWL CRM project. The other thing is trying to create signage. And the last, all of the ACOR associate directors, Chris Tuttle, Glenn Corbett, and Jack Green, have all worked on the signage elements. And so I won't elaborate, but this is the ones that you see now that were supported by funds <clears throat> from ACOR USAID Shep Grant. Um, I particularly love if you're down on the colonnaded street and you look up at the Temple of the Alliance and you get the right angle, you gotta sort of peer your head. This was a sign that was created, unfortunately the glass, I don't think is extant anymore, but fortunately down on the uh, plaque itself, you can see what the aim was to show you the reconstruction. And if you looked up on the hill, this massive Nabataean temple that collapsed in the earthquake of 363, but would have been a central place within the city center. The TWL CRM project led to USAID's interest in ACOR creating something more sustainable throughout the country. And this was called SHEP. SHEP had many different components. We finally got the grant in 2014. It was first initiated basically in 2012. We wrote the grants in 2013. Many people helped us do it. And in the end, there were all these multiple sites. You, can't, uh, you can learn tons on their website. These are the original sites. I'll make an allusion to Omar Jamal, to Tawihi Masukhar. You already know a little bit about the Petra of the Lions. These other two fascinating sites, again, go to the website and learn all about them. The last site that was added to the roster of Shep supported sites was this amazing site called Beit Ras. It's a hypogeum of the Roman period, which is underground in the city near Irbid in the north, that in November 2016, this incredible painted tomb was discovered. I will admit to being a little sheepish when Shihad Harun mentioned to me, well, what about helping preserve Beit Ras? I didn't realize this discovery had been made, so I didn't understand what was being asked. Fortunately, soon I learned, and ACOR, because of the request of the Department of Antiquities and a French, um, uh, basically, colleague and many others, there's many, many uh, participants in this. And this is where I'm gonna say, 
nowadays, I think archaeology and heritage management in Jordan have to be really collaborative efforts, both in terms of expertise and money. Um, but I must say that this is one that I'm particularly proud that ACOR was able to help preserve. If you want to know the story of Shep, it's easily accessible, downloaded from the ACOR website on this very booklet that we created for the first phase. Because of course, when you have a grant, you have to write a report. And they made this a report that's very accessible with fantastic pictures and letting people understand the different components. Um, Ghor Safi is a place down in, in the uh, Jordan Valley, the lowest point on earth. And Dino Politis has been working there for decades, two of his lectures three are on the ACOR website. And this is the medieval sugar mill. Again, you can learn more about it from him or from the booklet that I'm about to show. Um, one thing was great is I was able to take different uh, directors. So this is Andrew McCarthy from Kari in Cyprus. And Dino's giving us a tour of this museum. Then a few years later, I ended up going, and I want to say, Shep is actually quite gender blind. Somehow I was the only woman, this whole group of men, but if you go look at the website, you can see there are a lot of wonderful women working for Shep. Uh, but in any case, we were going there to see the signage because one of the main challenges of all site work is signage. So here you can learn about Laura Safi through this new book that was actually published um, as a PDF on the ACOR website, easily accessible and downloaded on your computer and it's really fun to see. But in there, there's actually a description of the very signs that are on, were intended on site some have been vandalized. This is one that I took earlier, which basically talks about the area and essentially saying that unfortunately these things don't last. So producing a brochure or a booklet that can be handed out is really essential for keeping this sort of legacy of scholarship alive. We had the opportunity at ACOR through a KROC seminar to 12 college professors, mostly from minority serving institutions and some black colleges and actually from Navajo Nation last January to take them around. And actually Shep was a major guiding force to understand this idea of sustainability. Uh, there's uh, Jack Green as associate director explaining this workshop and the, the goals and methodology. We get to go to the Petrum um, uh, Museum and here you, I'm sorry, the Jordan Museum. I'm getting tired, I can tell that. Um, and that was on the first day. Um, we were very lucky that uh, Deputy Director Ahmed al Mumani, or actually one of the curators, Ahmed al Mumani, with close ties with ACOR, took us around. Um, and this group was able to experience another Shep site, Umul Jamal. There's a recent ACOR newsletter, but if you're interested in the site, the um, website maintained by Calvin College and um, Open Hand Studio uh, is an excellent one. Um, I actually show the, some of four members of the uh, professors from January of 2020, but I took my older sister Ellen and her family around there. So I want to say that visiting Jordan, taking people to these sites, learning and trying to experience perhaps different things. You could have the new group hand by hand, have these two young local authorities talk about the site in their midst, you could Jihad Suleiman and some of Zahur, you can just go to the website and book your time. And again, Signage has been a problem there. This is from the earlier visit. They've now tried to create 32 kilometers. No, it isn't that right. They've created 32 signs within the site to, to allow people around. And I have to say, I offer, I thank <clears throat> KORC participants uh, for these um, seminar participants for these images, because for some reason I have lost all those slides. Um, if you're going to go to Jordan, just like if you were going to Turkey, you would want to make sure that you have wonderful meals. And this is done by a woman's cooperative at Umar Jamal. So again, another experience to have. And there you see um, Shahad Suleiman, who's a former site steward on the Shep project, who then has segued into this local community endeavor, basically explaining to all of us what we're eating. Um, my last few slides talk about a year ago today. Essentially, um, Pierce Paul Christman arrived on March 1. He came late the night of the 29th. And his first public eco lecture was by Dino Politis. Again, you can watch that on YouTube. And we had many um, special people there. We were able to actually, um, that same morning, we went to the Department of Antiquities so we could meet people. We met the former um, Director General Yazid Elian. We're very lucky that the current acting director, Ahmed Al Shami, was actually present at this particular lecture. And then a week later, <clears throat> on the 16th, we went for 
Embassy, which is in the U.S. Embassy, so of course you can't take pictures, so I can't document that. But we were at the Jordan Museum with Ihab Amarin and other close colleagues, uh, receiving, of course, wonderful gifts in both places. Um, and all to say that these are uh, the first period of time we managed to actually um, see everybody that we could. But of course, on March 17th, as everybody knows, things closed down. So my last official trip to Petra was taking the king and queen of Norway around. And I and this I took many groups around. Probably the biggest challenge was Obama, President Obama came and I had to take his press crew around in an hour and 15 minutes, show them everything in Petra and get them out in an hour and 15 minutes. But there was a slightly more leisurely time for the king and queen and it was an extraordinary day. Luckily, Pierce Paul and Jack Green could be participants. And I have to say that if you're gonna make it your last day to visit Petra, it was extraordinary. But likewise, that evening, the uh, head of the Petra Development Region Tourism Authority, Suleiman Farjat, created a special meal for me in front of the Petra Church. I've been thinking about the Petra Church on and off since about 2002. So to have that to be one of my last official goodbyes was extraordinary. So I can't thank enough all the people in Jordan for what they've done, what they've contributed to who I am now. And this is just a simple way to say the PowerPoint presentations, we borrow from each other liberally. So I've used ones that were previously used by the Bakais, by Chris Tuttle, Glenn Corbett, Jack Green, but I know they do the same for me. I give them full authority to do so. And I thank all the other funding institutions and supporters. And now we're gonna go and I'm gonna see the Zoom room I'm looking forward to seeing all of you and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Bye. So there we are. Who's here? <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Barbara. Um, yeah, you can please turn yourselves on so we can all see you uh, now. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of questions. Maybe I'll take the opportunity to ask the first question, but before that, I will remind you that you made the offers to take us to Jordan when we can. So I will be bugging you on this, <laughs> not run away from us. So I'm very excited about that. Um, Cause I've never been to Jordan. I'm kicking myself for not going before this new world order hit us. So um, I just, just a quick question. I mean, there's so much work that um, ACOR is doing, and I'm sure that's not the only archaeology that's being done in the country. Um, I know it's and, and there really isn't much in terms of the seaside, but is there anything that has to do with maritime research that's being done? Well, that's a very interesting question. Actually, Shep was able to support work in Aqaba, where they were able to help train some local uh, people who were part of the site steward. Um, Mustafa Ajuri learned how to do underwater archaeology. Specialists from Egypt came. So let's hope that they, that will happen. There's also more official um, US government, I'm sorry, Jordanian government authorities that are hoping to do that. I also know that, um, you know, Bob Ballard was planning to do some work there, but there's relatively limited um, work so far. Um, yeah. Okay, so hopefully there'll be interest in, on the side of the government. So that again it takes or, money and expertise yeah okay excellent questions anybody so i i see there's quite a bit on the chat i'm going to look at the chat but i'm going to let you um monitor the questions i think uh let's see or actually i can read through and see if there are any in the chat that i can i think they're mostly um expressions of love uh, by the <laughs> way um Morek Carcel offered to share her um, article on the orcs and soft diplomacy, and her email is here. So uh, please, if you're interested, uh, drop her a line and she will share that very important article with you. Um, and, and if she didn't put her email, then we'll make sure that we can be done through the friends of, of Arit. Yeah, you can always bug me for any questions any information on anybody and I'll do my best to connect you with whatever you're interested in. So feel free to do so. Okay. Well, I, as I wanted to say, it's really wonderful to see everybody. What I do need to do is now go see who else is in the Zoom room. So let's see who else I can capture. <laughs> uh, where is the email? Uh, the where email is the email? 
is, hold on, it's in the chat. In the chat. Okay. I, yeah. So I would say that if somebody wants uh, to actually ask the question directly, they probably can if they're feeling um, neglected. I am. Hi, homie. Sharing Morag's email again, if I can. Please do, because I can't find it. Yeah. yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll actually send some links afterwards to all the participants of that article. Um, I also am going to share then my, my Nabataean talk for those who are interested. Uh, and we'll think of some other things. And yes. if, if yes. Arat Umkar is willing to do that, I think it will help everybody a lot instead of having to look right now. Um, Actually, I would have liked to uh, record this one too, but it's a, but I needed a prior permission apparently. Well, actually, what well, they, they're they're doing it now. So what we'll do is we'll have them send a link to this, so you can share with anybody you like. So that's very oh, nice. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, you. Yeah. Please drop me a line. This is being recorded. Um, I know some people have questions, but yeah. one thing, uh, Pierce Paul Cressman, if I'm pronouncing. Yeah, Cressman. Yeah. Yes, the new director. Yes. yes. Um, saying that I did my doctorate in the nautical archaeology program at Texas A&M. So needless to say, I am work, uh, working on future maritime projects in Georgia. So that's really good. And also, I would like to share with you the sad news that we just recently lost George Bass. So mm. a huge milestone um, in the history of uh, maritime archaeology in Turkey and elsewhere in the world. So, um. actually, Elif, I just want to add that, of course, um, my interaction with George Bass was when he wanted to give his slides from his trip to Jerusalem and Jordan in the late 50s to ACOR. And so, he, thanks to my sister Joan, I brought them back to ACOR. They're now on ACOR's website. So, if you want to know him not as just a person who worked in nautical archaeology, you can see him as a young person experienced in Jerusalem and writing back to his family. Wow. Mm -hmm. So Morag is raising her hand. Morag, would you like to jump in? Yeah. Um, thanks, Barbara. That was amazing. I'm on my phone, so I'm not going to use my video because uh, I also have not very much bandwidth. But I was just wondering if there's anything you think you left that you wish you would have done while you were still in Jordan. Uh, interesting question. Um, I, I think in terms of the collaboration with all of our colleagues, we all would like to do more of that. The trouble is we all get so busy trying to keep our own institutes running, be it fundraising or just activities. So I think in the future, more, I mean, we, we do collaborate and you more, I certainly know that, but I think there could be more uh, concerted efforts to keep that going. And obviously the Department of Antiquities and the other government authorities are the ultimate. Uh, but I'll be, for example, you know, sometimes there'll be projects in Petra where people don't know that they're actually doing almost the same, same, same thing. So making sure that they're, and Shep is really trying to also help the department do this, create a database where people can be really aware of what's happening. Because to, to, to raise the money to do a project that's already on the ground is kind of sad, <laughs> thanks, frankly. Thanks. Thank okay, you. For the question. Here are some questions. I'm going to um, read them quickly without the names, um, but you can check them on the side. Somebody's wondering if you've lectured in any Jordanian universities. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I could take, show you pictures of Hashemite University, Yarmouk University, University of Jordan, Al Hussein bin Talal. Now, it's a very important part of ACORS Outreach, and the other the various associate directors did as well. Sometimes they were even more active in participating in conferences done by those universities. And actually, there are even more universities. I'm just naming the main ones. So I would say that it's um, because not everybody can come to Amman. If you live up in the north in Irbid, it's not so easy. And actually, to be honest, the first thing I ever did in Jordan in terms of outreach was Zaydan Kafafi, who was a very close friend. We excavated in the Jordan Valley together in 77 when he was professor at your MOOC, he invited me to give a talk. And so it was the last slide lecture I gave or gave, 2006, on Egyptian art. Um, thereafter, I realized I had to switch to PowerPoint. But in any case, I did go up there 
And what was wonderful, because he drove me up, I actually learned how to drive out of Amman and get to Cherash. Okay, here's another question. What are the top priorities you believe that need to be addressed in preserve, preserving archaeology in Jordan? The, the documentation under the Department of Antiquities, which is now Mega Jordan and might become Arches, having that documentation is great, but if it's not used across all of the entities, like the Ministry of Planning, all every single ministry should have access to that. So if somebody's let's say the uh, Greater Amman Municipality wants to do construction like they just did downtown, they would actually have much more better understanding. Yes, that there actually is a Roman bath complex underneath spot of the, of the street. So I would say that having the department be able to reach out and that was something that was already in the 90s they were trying to do. But again, I would also say it's probably just like the institutes, the ministries all have to take care of their own entities and don't often realize who they should reach out to, to be actually coordinating event efforts. Um, so I hope that will happen in the future. And again, I think there's certain people who are really trying. And I'll say that some of the younger generation academics and students who are now much more GIS uh, savvy and can use the tools, uh, modern tools of the trade, they will make a difference because they're already basically challenging some of the things that have been done in the past to make sure that the future is better. Okay, here's another question. Um, what is the most important role that you see overseas research centers like ACOR playing in preserving cultural heritage? I think it's supporting the institutions in country, but also helping poor institutions basically engage in the best possible way within the country. And that may be, I mean, unlike Turkey, it's quite different in Jordan. We do. Basically, people do their own applications to the department, but facilitating that, but also providing information about, again, perhaps what people are doing, what uh, needs, very rarely would ACOR ever suggest something that needs to be done. Usually the projects are instigated by individuals, but there used to be periods where they would prioritize and say, these are almost rescue projects that are, are dying to happen, uh, or because a street or a um, highway is going through. And Ghazal might be one, another example, just north, the road to Jerash went through the site of Tel Safut, and that was a 1980s project that ACOR helped with. Okay. Um, here's another question. Um, are there any Islamic period materials, especially Ottoman, I suppose what he means is in these projects? Um, well, for, for one, at Umkais, that rest house is actually built within the Ottoman ruins, which are spectacular. I, I happen to love vernacular architecture. Also Madaba, the site itself is surrounded by Ottoman period houses to about 1920. Uh, so there's a lot there. Right behind me, if I had time, I'd bring out this fantastic new book by um, Omar Hamash and Thomas Weber Ariotokis on all the Islamic sites. It's another gazetteer that just got published um, that if you want to say, oh yeah, now what was the date of that Islamic monument? It's all there. So. Throughout the country, there's tons. ACOR has done less work on the Islamic sites, but it, of course, has, if it's there, <clears throat> it would honor it. And the Ottoman period buildings around the structures it's worked at, certainly were taken care of. Not preserved, because that's, again, another grant, usually. Um, so, I mean, um, here's a question for me. Um, what is the, what is considered antiquity? What is the time period? Because a lot of Ottoman stuff in Turkey is not considered quite antiquity here. Well, and that's the major problem in Jordan as well, because the dividing line is 1750. So mm -hmm. antiquity is before that, and after that is heritage, and it's different authorities. And that's, again, back to the question that was asked, what should be different? A lot more of this should be preserved. Um, also, I know that in Turkey is very strict about you know, like Ottoman period objects being taken out. Um, Jordan is less strict about that. And so where does the heritage go? You know, there's some museums that have it, some people are collectors, but you also really want to have people a bit more awareness of what you're taking out of the country than exists today. Right, but are there, I mean, there are laws, right, that, that control... Um... Well, the very strict laws for antiquities, but the post 1750, is a bit murkier. 
And you know, again, the Greater Amman municipality you'd be addressing if you were going to work on a building there. Stalt, which is a spectacular site, which I didn't talk about, which is just north of Amman, which has much of the early, say, 1900 to 1920, like the 1880 to 1920, basically the capital before Amman was in 1920. That architecture has had some restoration phases in various ways. They were trying to put it on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But um, in terms of you know, preservation, a lot of it is also local initiatives that are also pretty crucial. Um, and there have been some other you know, uh, outside funding as well, of course. Well, is there any interest in modern architecture, preserving modern architecture? Um, yes, there is. And I was very privileged in the beginning of my time there to work on a committee with the Greater Imam Municipality that was sort of organized with May Sha'er and actually now Ihab Amarin, the head of the Jordan Museum, and Rami Daher, where he particularly was worried about the 1960s buildings. And those of you who've been to Amman know Rainbow Street. Well, some of those buildings are actually really fascinating, but have basically been, uh, oh, I don't know what graceful term to use, but not particularly handled in a very sympathetic way. We, in theory, were supposed to be the ones decided how if somebody could put a cafe, you know, where there's a cafe like 10 meters away, do you need another cafe? How many ice cream shops do you need on Rainbow Street? Uh, so, but I would say that's still something that's still under um, concern, but there are people, the architects I would say that I got to meet in my time in Jordan are a very strong group. And so and some wonderful new architecture being done. So that would be a talk alone for those who are interested. Wow. Um, but you know, I, I didn't get there. I mean, I even consider Acor's building a very important building from the 80s. Uh, the architect was Farid Habib, it got added onto in 2005, but it was a very restrained architecture. And of course, at the time, it was in the middle of nowhere. Now, you know, Amman's kept growing and growing and growing, kind of like Ankara. Uh, so, um, but I'm really glad that the integrity of that building has been preserved. That's, that's very interesting. I think, I think a lot of people in Turkey would be interested in seeing how modern architecture is developed and how preserving modern architecture is kind of um, right. happening. I would, re I would happening. recommend going to the website of Amar Hamash, whose name was in the uh, several times because he was the one who did the rest houses and, other, and the projects in, in Madaba. But on his website, you can see some of the contemporary architecture. One of my favorites is a um, the Royal Society of Conservation of Nature, which again, if you go, going to their um, reserves is really important. But he built in Ajloum, just outside the reserve, in a quarry. Uh, he took that space and has created an absolutely gorgeous building, one of my favorite buildings in the world. It did win, I think, an Aga Khan Prize. So again, if you're interested in modern architecture, go to his website. But the, I don't want to seem exclusive because there are other wonderful um, architects in Jordan um, today who are doing great projects like Rami Dahar and others. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll bug you more on that later. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any other questions? Anyone who wants to ask a question, say something? I see an enthusiastic group of people with energy. <laughs> as much well, energy as we can get from the, the screen. <laughs> I hope that the friends of Arendt in Ankara, uh, that they were well represented because it was for you. But I also thank you for letting me have my friends in Jordan and the rest of the world um, participate. And I actually have to ask, thank Nancy Lyonwan because the original Zoom room was only 100 and she increased it to 500. So according to Aleph, there were about 190 who said they'd participate. Who knows? I know we had a little glitch in the beginning when everybody could not get on because I, somehow we increased it, but it didn't go through or something. But Nancy did some magic and then we were able to get more well, people. but again, she, she did a lot of magic. Every time I asked a question, she gave me the answer within an hour. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and again, we're recording this. So anybody who wants a recording of this, please drop us a line and we will share the uh, recording with you as soon as we upload it. So if there are no other questions, we will uh, let Barbara relax. Thank right. you and so I'll, much. Thank and you I so much. Welcome. And those overseas can have a drink. Oh. <laughs> and again, we will have a drink hey. together in Turkey or Jordan sometime after this period is over, hopefully. Inshallah. Yes. Let's hope so. Inshallah. Inshallah.
And, and good luck to everyone in these hard times. At least this allowed more people to attend my lecture than had I been in Ankara at your headquarters. So, Excellent. So, and good luck with all the changes that might happen. So yes, take thank care. You. Thank and you. Wishing you well. Much. Okay. Bye. Bye, -bye. Say, thank you. I would like a lot. I, I would like to say up. thank you in the name of Tony Cross, who would be so excited to see this lecture. Thank oh. you, Pat. That's yes. really lovely to say. Thank you. Yeah. So, you now she played a major role too. That's for sure. Yeah. So, oh, and I see Don Keller's on it. Yay! Actually, I'll just look a little bit and see who my friends are because I couldn't see everybody. I'm on my laptop, which is much smaller. So, and there's yeah. Harriet. Yay! Lots of dear friends. So, so. Very nice. Michelle in Paris. Say, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take Thank care. All right. Bye-bye, Barbara. Thanks. Matulama. Thanks again for coming. Bye. Yeah, look at all. Lots of people. That's really nice. Feels like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> I'm just looking at everybody leave <laughs> before turning everything off. <laughs> oh, wow. Bonnie. Yeah. Hi. How are you? How are you? Hi. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. I'm in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and uh, I saw uh, uh, an email, and I was able to get on. Excellent. It was really nice. Yeah. Long time no see. I know. I know. I can't get back. My parents and everyone's gone after ten years, <laughs> but I can't get back to Turkey. I mean, <laughs> you keep having worse shutdowns, lockdowns. I and, know. Or, I know. Oh, Hopefully, it's hopefully it'll be over. It'll be over. And then we'll start moving around again. Yes. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you should be one of the first ones I stop and see. Yeah. Wonderful to see you. It's, Thank you. It's, it's great. Great years doing this. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye, Pam. Bye, Nancy. Bye, everyone who's hiding behind their pictures and all that. I'm turning this off now. Okay, bye, bye, thank you.